Welcome to ABG, Asian Boss Girl, a podcast for the modern day Asian American woman. My name is Helen. I'm Janet. I'm Mel. And I'm Jenny. Jenny Han is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Two All the Boys I've Loved Before series. She's also the executive producer on all three of the Netflix films, To All the Boys I've Loved Before, To All the Boys, P.S. I Love You, and to the final film, To All the Boys, Always and Forever. It's hard to believe. I'm standing in a timeless dream. What all started with a letter, a hot tub, and a diner could turn into this. Hi. Thank Hi, you guys Jenny. for having me. Hi. Our listeners are big fans of the movies, so we want to hear a little bit about how you grew up. So we know you're a Korean American. You grew up in Richmond, Virginia. So mm-hmm. what was that like? You know, how would you describe Jenny in high school? Jenny in high school was in some ways kind of in heaven because um, in middle school, I went to a pretty like white middle school and I got teased because I was sort of the only Asian in the school. I really didn't want to go to the same high school with all those people. And so I then applied for a um, magnet school called Governor's School. And then it was so diverse. And my friends were like Sikh and, and like Muslim and like Hindu and like all different kinds of um, cultures. It was it was a, a different kind of high school experience because essentially everyone was kind of a nerd. Um, but people were proud to be <laughs> nerds, I guess, in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you share with our listeners when was the moment you knew you wanted to be a writer and how did you land specifically in the young adult genre you know i've always been a writer like when i was little i used to write stories um in my notebooks i never really thought i could be a writer because i'd never seen one that was um, asian american or young it really wasn't until i was in college and i took a writing workshop then after i took that class i thought well you know what i think maybe I could be a writer. And when I graduated, I applied for graduate school for writing programs, but I also was applying for publishing jobs, like anything that would put me near books um, and stories was where I wanted to be. So I I think I applied to like a bunch of different programs, but I really wanted to go to New York and I really wanted to, to get my MFA. And that was like the main um, goal for me. I got into everything I, I, I applied for and, but that was the top choice. and. That was probably the scariest decision because I took out a bunch of loans and, um, you know, moving to New York, like it's a big life decision, I think, because mm-hmm, it's, I had yeah. never lived in such a big city before, you know? Um, but I remember that my mom, when I told her I wanted to do that, she was like, you're going to be successful. Like you have, you have a special gift. So like, I'm really not, we're not like worried about you. Like it's going to be fine. Cause I was just like, you know, $30,000 in, in, loans. If you go and get your master's in teaching or you go to law school, you'll probably get a job afterwards. But with a master's in creative writing, there's really no guarantees. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. you're really kind of putting yourself out there. What drew you to the young adult genre specifically? I've always, and I continue to be interested in, and I would say moved by the teenage experience. Um, I think because it is such a heady, like passionate, like compelling time to be alive. You are experiencing things for the first time in your life. Um, you are sort of in a new body. Mm-hmm. You have like the, just physically like hormones are like racing through your body and you have very little control over your life. And I really feel like I've always tried to approach writing for young people as the same as I would for writing for an adult because the experiences um, might be different, but the feelings are really the same. and. You know, when you get into a horrible fight with your best friend in high school and you're like, I don't even know who I'm going to like sit with today at lunch and you're so alone, like that emotion isn't so different than when you, as an adult, you know, have a hard day at work. I don't think one is more important than the other. I love that. I definitely felt so much of that in Always and Forever, these like deep uncertainties and also just pure excitement for, for life. Do you ever feel a need to stay relevant with like the new generation and the mm-hmm. trends that are going on just to make sure, you know, to make sure that it's being appropriately reflected in the film and in, in your books? I just like youth culture. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that young people are always doing cool, smart, fun stuff. And mm-hmm. I think it's boring um, to like look down on that or think that like 
it's not worth your time or like people finding that stuff to be silly. I just think they're silly because it makes them seem really like stale. You know what I mean? Like it's really mm. just connecting with people and being able to see everyone has a story to tell. Everybody is important. I think as a storyteller, I'm just curious, very curious. And I'm always wanting to know what people's stories are and understanding their character for me just kind of reaches over all like of the age spectrum. You know, one thing I noticed is like, you know, to all the boys series, you know, Laura Jean is half Korean. You know, throughout the series, you know, you showcase moments of the Korean culture. Did you pull inspiration from your own life to write these moments? You know, what aspects of your culture has affected your work? In the third film, when she goes to visit Korea, um, mm -hmm. that I really was like um, pushing to have a moment for her to say like, that she wishes she could speak the language and she feels like a little embarrassed and she can't. And mm -hmm. for me, like I've always struggled with that because like I can speak Korean, but like not amazing. Whenever I would go to Korea, I always felt really embarrassed. So I, I think that's kind of a common experience for second generation kids yeah. to go back and, and visit. And you feel like, in some ways you feel like you feel really connected. In some ways you feel really like American. It was important to me that the Korea part of the film didn't feel like the same as it would feel as if they were in Italy or France for mm -hmm. vacation. Like that it was be a little bit more personal. As an Asian American writer, what are some of the most challenging experiences you have faced in the industry? I think now it's it's easier to get published um, as a person of color because they've seen that there are some successes with that. But I think when I was first starting out, maybe one of one or two Korean American YA authors, you know, or even Asian American authors. I tried to sell a book with an Asian American character early on, and I was told that they already had one. They weren't going to buy another one. And so mm. there really was a sense that scarcity mentality was true. They had one per season and they weren't gonna do more. Um, and so much of the journey has been about um, trying to stay true to what I wanna do and also um, find ways to be fresh and um, find connection with my readers. There is so much pressure just on representation where you feel like people are like, this better be good or else um, mm. you're not gonna get another one. This is this is it. Like, you know, if this if this doesn't do well, then there's not gonna be another teen romance with an Asian person in it, like anytime soon, mm. we've seen that happen. And so I think there's just like a lot of pressure on creators. I think what I would wish is that we just have more options and a bigger spectrum of experience. And so that the things that make it made don't have this huge pressure on them to do well mm. and to also to portray um, the Asian American experience in its totality. Because as we know, it is not monolithic. Um, and there's no, there is no one Asian American experience, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone ha has a different experience. And I wish that we could get more of that spectrum. So um, people could just be free to tell like a really good story that people connect to. Um, something that we talk about a lot on our podcast uh, is this notion of imposter syndrome. Obviously, you've been in so many different rooms where you might be the only Asian woman in the room. Were there ever any moments where you felt imposter syndrome? And if so, can you walk us through a moment where you might have felt it the heaviest? I have not felt that way in publishing because I feel very comfortable there because I've, I've been there for a long time. And mm -hmm. um, I really understand that business and I understand the New York culture because that's where publishing lives. Um, I think for me, the harder entry has been into the Hollywood aspect because it's really different um, mm. than publishing. It's, it's, I think publishing is really straightforward where if they buy your book, then your book is it's gonna be published. Um, and in film, there's a lot more sort of nuance about people making a lot of deals and then rarely does something actually get made. There's just a lot of etiquette that, and I'm somebody who's, I think, probably because of being sort of of two cultures is really sensitive to etiquette and mm. like, you know, nunchi, you know, the Korean mm. word nunchi, like of, of understanding the vibe of the room and making sure that you're not like overstepping or mm -hmm. um, that you know your position in the room. And mm. I think that I'm really like attuned to that. So I always feel like, um, like, I don't want to make a mistake when it comes to that. So mm -hmm. I would say that's probably the time when I felt like, um, I don't know if that's imposter syndrome necessarily, but it's of maybe uncertain, like less certain, even though in other aspects of my career, I felt very comfortable and confident. 
I think it's very like uh, your parents teach you like, oh, be careful, be polite, make sure you're not like, in a sense, like ruffling any feathers. So, so in essence, you're kind of like walking on eggshells, but you're not trying to, but you're trying to just be respectful to everyone involved. So I can imagine beyond that, you're like, okay, I'm gonna just be careful, but I want to, you know, be involved too. So yeah, but, one of the worst like Korean insults is like, oh, they they have no nunchi, which is like yeah. somebody who's so like so like tactless and like boorish mm-hmm. and like kind of tacky. But, but but Jenny, do you feel like that's necessary in within like mm. Hollywood? Because you hear that all the time that you have to just be like super type A personality, super in front of the room, just getting your message out there. No, for me, I feel comfortable because, in a way, I think that being an author has really prepared me for this mm. because, um, you know, we have to go out and sell our books. Honestly, like, uh, in a way, being an author it feels like being a traveling salesperson. You like mm. almost like you have a trunk and then you pull out like here are my wares here are my books please buy them you know that's how it's like at a book signing especially when you're just starting out and people don't know who you are it's like yeah can i interest you in this book (laughs) um (laughs) and then you have to be able to to pitch it and to do the quick few sentence elevator pitch to say here's what my book is i would say the hardest audience you'll ever find is a room of like 13 year olds and like Mm -hmm. in a middle assembly because they're bored and they're like entertain me we've we've definitely done a couple of uh college speaking events where we felt the same we're like trying to make a joke and then no one did you just see a stone like a stony face and it's like okay (laughs) but but on the other side of the coin there's nobody more like when they love it there's nobody more passionate more Mm -hmm. pure um just like pure emotions and like joy and like tears and connection and like you just feel like it's a giant like beating heart in front of you you know and Very that true. is like the best part of my job is being able yeah. to connect um with young readers who are telling me this is the first book um that they ever even really read by themselves or that made them want to read and mm-hmm. being a part of that journey of a young reader is really profound and moving and then they will always remember you because I always remember the books I read as a kid. So we know this is the final installment of the film. How do you feel about the series being over now? And it feels good to like close this chapter and, and then sort of dream about what's next. Um, because as a storyteller, I have so many stories inside of me that mm-hmm. I, I'm so excited to tell. And it is satisfying to have finished this one um, and feel proud of it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jenny. Uh, this is such a great, I don't know, I feel like I learned a lot from you. And and listeners, don't forget to check out All the Boys, Always Forever, out on Netflix now. Bye! Bye. Bye. Bye.